why did God plant this then? There's this tree of knowledge of good and evil, knowing that if we ate from it, we would die on that day. But what kind of love is that? Uh, good question. And again, we have every right to ask and seek and not. Um, and this is truly a, a great mystery. It's, it's the mystery of love. It's the mystery of, of free will. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Out of the Box Podcast, where Steve and I, your host, get to talk about outside of the box ideas. Today, we're super excited. We have a special guest here with us, uh, Father Will, all the way from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Father Will is a, a really great friend uh, of, of my family, of me, a uh, great priest, um, you know, a great shepherd of, of his community. Um, and a very charismatic priest that is really looking to change the culture of, of our, our day through love, through, through the fundamentals, through prayer. And we brought him here today to ask him a couple questions uh, that you guys have asked us in our community and that we also have come up ourselves. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Father Will. Thank you for being here. And we appreciate you taking your time to, to come on the show with us. And thanks be to God. Awesome. Thank you. And to start us off, Steele will ask the first question. Uh, so kick it off, Steele. All right. Well, I guess let's start off with a warm-up question. Um, let's go with why. So, yeah, this is a common question I've heard, actually, um, when I was doing a lot of research on trying to find kind of, I guess, for lack of a better term, evidence for God. And one of the questions I come across um, from the other side is like, why does God not just automatically put everyone in heaven to avoid all evil? And so I think that's a really interesting, yeah. Question, it surely, yeah. it certainly is. And in, indeed, Jesus commands us to ask and, and seek and knock. So I, I really applaud and encourage those that are asking and seeking and knocking. And certainly uh, there's this great questions, the great mystery of, of evil. If God is so good, why is there evil? If God is so good, why doesn't he just place us now in heaven? Uh, this is the great mystery of being the image and likeness of God, the full dignity of, of who we are. We are the image and likeness of God. God is love. Love is, a, is freedom. You can't force anyone to love. It must come from your own free will. Love in self is a mystery, what it means. But a truly love is to freely give yourself to another, seeking the best, seeking their best, even to the point of willing to lay down your life. So we have free will. With our free will, we have the, the power to choose to love. But we also have the power not to love. That's our free will. There are consequences to our choices. Scripture says, before you is water and fire, stretch out your hand. Whatever you choose is what you get. Um, and so before us is life and death. The meaning of heaven, to truly be who we are, the children of God, the image and likeness of God, requires our free will. And that requires this great journey, this great uh, test of love. Is our love real or fake? And so we must make a choice between Truth and lies, good and evil, real love or fake love, life and death. And, and the way to heaven is to choose the way of love. And he became one of us. His name is Jesus. So heaven and ourselves in heaven requires our free will. Yeah, I'm really, I'm glad that you brought up about free will because there's a lot of questions about free will too. And, and, and that's what I was, yeah, I mean, that's what I was kind of uh, arguing myself about, like, because, you know, if God didn't give us free will, then I feel like it's just not love, you know, because when you force, like when you force love, you could, you could look at relationships in life, like romantic relationships or any kind of relationships and say, you know, force love, it's no good love at all. It's just fake, you know? And, and I think that's kind of what you're tapping into. Like, you know, God is the most genuine form of love and he can't force us to follow his will. And I think that's the beautiful thing about it. So like, yeah, when people say like, oh, well, how can God allow all this evil? And, and why doesn't he just put us in heaven? It's like, well, that's not genuine love then, right? You know, like kind of what you're tapping into. Yeah, yeah we're not machines. You know, I don't know if you've heard of 
Mary Beth Bonacci, but she's got this great teaching about pizza love. We used to love that word love a lot. You know, we love, we love God. We love our parents. We love our, yeah. we love our friends. We love our cat and our dog. We love our computer. You know, we love pizza. Um, and when we get sick of pizza, we put it in the refrigerator and then we forget about it. It gets all moldy and then we just throw it away. So we use the love for everything. Uh, you know, we love our phone, but if it doesn't work, it's no good. If it's no good, we'll then just throw it away, get another one. We're not robots. We're not machines and we're not pizza. Uh, we were children of God. You know, the full dignity of who we are uh, requires our free will. So yeah, where does evil come from? God does not create evil. It's those who have free will who choose not to choose God, not to choose his will, not to choose love. Uh, evil entered in the world through fallen angels, but also through fallen humanity by choosing not to love. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's interesting, uh, Stu, that you mentioned that question because, you know, God in itself, you know, created the angels who were with him, right, in heaven, right? But why did he create human beings, right? You know, and that that's, that's I guess, you know, answering your question of, like, why wouldn't God just create us in heaven, right? Because he had created angels already, and they, they already saw God. They knew God. They loved God, right? But, though, but he wanted to, he created us without having seen God since birth, you know? You know, maybe we saw love, we saw touches of God in itself, but he created beings that could, like Father Will said, have free will, that without knowing Without knowing at first that there was a God, you know, in itself, they grew to understand that there was and believe, right? And I think, I think that's, that's a really great mystery, yeah, right? You know, sometimes I think about it like, um, let's say we didn't have, or let's say we did go in heaven, right? Like we went to heaven right away um, when God first created everything. Well, I feel like we wouldn't be able to have appreciation because you have to have, you have to know what you lose and what you have and you have to know what love and you have to know what hate is and everything in between those two things in order to have appreciation for things for people for even god so like i wonder you know if god just put us all in heaven as human beings would we not have appreciation for those things you know i don't know mm. well said yeah, maybe, Thank you. yeah maybe maybe that's why god in in his powerfulness created us his children right because he wanted, he wanted living beings that freely in, in their will would follow him, would love him, would come back to him, right? Because he knew the angels would already, but he wanted somebody or some, something, a human being, a living creature that would just in itself boast for God. Right. You know? And, and, and I, I've heard also, you know, angels they already see God, but for a human being to believe in God and love God, you know, it's, it's like another level because angels already love God and see God. Right. And so there's nothing to prove, right. There's nothing else to prove for yeah, them. Yeah. But for us oh, yeah. that we can't really prove it because we exist outside of the realm of God. Right. We re really can't prove God out here when we have just, you know, our limit, limited, you know, resources to try to figure out, you know, God, we can just see the uh, fingerprint, right? The, the blueprint, but we don't see the creator in itself, right? Unless he reveals himself yeah. to us. Yeah. Well, the and, then, and then not even all the angels followed God, uh, if I remember correctly, like, I mean, Lucifer, for example, right? The fallen angel. And then the angels um, that I think walked the earth. Um, Genesis, I can't remember. It was, it was one of those I remember it talked about the angels walk the earth, but then it's a debated topic because it said the sons of the sons of God walk the earth. Right. And that's, yeah, that's, that's, what was that? You're near the beginning, Genesis chapter five, I believe, or six. Uh, yeah, this is a great mysterious passage of the, the sons of God. So here's what it says is um uh, when man began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not continue 
with man forever. He is mortal. His days will be 120 years. So the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were heroes of old, men of renown. These great, great mysteries of uh, heaven and earth. And this great mixing of, of the two. Uh, the key point that I'm hearing you both say is, is blessed are those who believe and do not see. Our Father who art in heaven, well, we, we're not in heaven, we're on earth. So we don't fully see. If you remember, Thomas, the doubter, uh, came to believe in Jesus because he saw him and put his finger in, in his wounds in his side. And Jesus says, you believe because you've seen. And then he says, blessed are those who've not seen and believe. We are being put to the test. We see the fingerprints, as Jose said. We see the signs and wonders. We see creation, a revelation of the creator. But we don't see God face to face like the angels we are being put to the test on a whole level that angels were not um, because we don't fully see. When we don't fully say, see, will we believe? Blessed are those, again, who do not see but believe. And then that blessed, that beatific vision, ultimately we will be the reward of seeing what we believe now. Yeah, that makes sense because, you know, it's almost like, I guess it ties into faith too, you know, like uh, maybe it, like kind of a test of our faith as well. Um, Cause the angels did see. So yeah, like I always thought that was an interesting quote, blessed are those who cannot see, but still believe because I mean, yeah, because you know, if, if you're not an angel and you're not face to face with God, you would be more blessed because if you don't see God, but you still have that faith that really says something, you know? I think that's interesting. Um, there's another question. Um, so this is a question me and Jose had. Um, it was about, it was actually a question I came across a long time ago that I'm still kind of wrestling with in my mind. So it goes back to Genesis in the very beginning. Me and Jose were wondering, why did God create the forbidden fruit or like just in general, the forbidden fruit dilemma? Um, because, I mean, we think about God as omnipresent and omnipotent. So it's an interesting question of, like, why did he create the dilemma? You know, and I think there's a lot of interesting ways to look at it. Uh, sure. Faith must be tested and so must love. I don't know if, if you ever were in a situation where a, a girl said to you, I love you. And you had to ask, well, do you really love me or you just want some, to get something out of me? We must, love must be tested. Is this real love or is this fake love? Is this a, um, a genuine, authentic caring for me? Or do you want to just use me, manipulate me, and get something out of me? Uh, love must be tested. Faith must be tested. We're going through severe tests right now. And we see this test from the very beginning in the garden uh, where the God planted all the trees. You can eat from all the trees, but do not eat from the tree of of knowledge of good and evil. When you eat from that tree, you shall surely die on that day. Um, and uh, so when Eve and Adam ate from that tree, they didn't die that day. They, in fact, Adam lived for 930 years, but there was something in them that died. This original grace was lost because of original sin. Um, this choice to not put their trust in God, but to believe in the liar, the serpent. Did God really say that? As if you really can't trust what God's saying. He doesn't have his, the, your best interests in mind. He has a, an alternative motive. Therefore, you can't trust God. God's not good all the time. And because of that, that trust in God died in their hearts. They ate from this forbidden fruit. And what died was uh, their mind, their heart, and their body. Instead of having a, an enlightened mind, they had a darkened reason. We can have that stinky thinking of the, of the, the doubt, the despair, the depression, um, discouragement, all the, all the darkness in our mind, the heart, the hardened heart full of pride and arrogance and conceit and refusing to forgive that pride and self-righteousness. And then finally, the fallen flesh concupiscence. We have this tendency towards sin. Why did God plant this then? There's this tree of knowledge of good and evil, knowing that if we ate from it, we would die on that day. What kind of love is that? Uh, 
good question. And again, we have every right to ask and seek and knock. Um, and this is truly a, a great mystery. It's, it's the mystery of love. It's the mystery of, of free will. It's, uh, it's the mystery of lines in the road. You know, when you go driving and you get your driver's license, it's like, okay, if you obey the lines in the road, then you'll be fine. But if you break the lines in the road, like on, on this highway here, I-10, you know, you'll get in a car crash. So you must be obedient to the lines. This is the great paradox of freedom, that there's no freedom without obedience. That true freedom, freedom to love, requires obedience. Obedient to what is good. Obedient to what is true. And who is good, who is true, who is beautiful, but God alone. And so we are called to obey God. And this is where we find our freedom is brought to fulfillment. And for freedom to be brought to fulfillment, it must be tested. Do you choose to trust me or not? That's, that's the whole mystery of free will. And therefore, we have a choice. We can obey the lines in the road or we can choose to break. Them. And when we do, there's consequences. We can stick our hand in fire and if we do, we'll get burned. That's not God's fault. That's our bad choices that we've made. And again, that's the great mystery of free will, but it's necessary to love. And bringing love to fulfillment means we must learn to be obedient, obedient to God. And that's what Jesus does. He overcomes original sin and certainly in the garden, not the garden of of Eden, but the Garden of Gethsemane, where he says, you know, uh, take this cup of suffering away from me, not my will, though. Father, thy will be done. And to the very end, Jesus was obedient. And on the tree of life, the cross, he cried out, it is finished. It is fulfilled. He fulfilled in complete obedience to the will of God. And that's 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 the way to, to eat from the tree of life, eternal life, heaven, the fulfillment, eternal love, eternal joy, eternal peace, eternal life. Okay, it means that we must be obedient. That's where our freedom will be fulfilled. Right, and and I like how you you are talking about free will and love, you know, and how they're so interrelated and almost kind of interdependent on each other in some way. Because, like you're saying, like we can't really have true love without free will, and so in in that sense, you know that. I mean, yeah, with the forbidden fruit, we chose as human beings. Um, well, Adam and Eve. Uh, chose as human beings and then it went on to us to to not follow God's one commandment you know and and that led to all evil that exists now in, in some yeah in some way so yeah I think it's free will does definitely play a huge role in it you know it's so interesting that you know in his in his that it's, it's like an irony in being obedient you are freed you know, because sometimes you wouldn't think of it like that, right? Yeah. You, it, it, so most of the time, if you're obedient to someone, then you are being controlled by the other person. You are enslaved by the other person. You are, you know, uh, I guess, yeah, pretty much guided by the other person. Uh, and but it sounds like, you know, they're taking the lead and you're just following. Right. But but it in a Christian sense, it, it makes complete sense because if they're leading you to the right place where you should, where your, your humanity and yourself thrives in, right. Then they are leading you to freedom. It, it's almost like, it's almost like people who have a habit of smoking or a bad habit of, you know, not taking care of themselves uh, physically, you know, they, they find that once they start working out, once they stop smoking, you know, and go past that dark moment in their life, they, they become freed, right? They become freed of those bad habits that weren't allowing them to live, to thrive, to, to be themselves as human beings. And so I think that it's, it's good to follow the correct obedience, right? And so to be obedient to the right person or to, to, to God in itself, right? Because uh, we can be obedient to other things, but those leads can cannot lead us to freedom. It can lead us to to chaining ourselves to to bad habits, to enslavement, to other things. And so, I think that, that there is an irony in itself, and that's that. Sometimes I think the what I've gone through because I'm doing right now a consecration to uh with my girlfriend to to the immaculate heart of mary and in this process you know it's 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 interesting 
uh, that a lot of the saints would talk about enslaving themselves, you know, to the mother who, who gave birth to Jesus, to God, you know? And so who knows best, you know, their son than the mother, right? And so, uh, you know, that's, that's the enslavement part. Sounds, sounds almost, you know, like you're losing your freedom, but it's actually the reverse in this, in this case, right? Enslaving sure, if I can add to what to you're right saying, person is uh, freedom from and freedom for. We often define freedom as freedom from, freedom from any restraints, declaration of independence and the destruction of, and the end of slavery. We're free to do whatever we want. We have no restraints. Uh, that's, that's one definition, but the, the higher definition of freedom is freedom for, freedom for excellence. Um, the freedom to be able to play the violin, to be able to play the piano requires tremendous obedience, discipline, practice. And only with, with tremendous practice can you freely play the violin or play mm. the piano. Freedom for excellence requires obedience, to be obedient to all the steps necessary to achieve the, these skills. And the same thing with virtues, to the freedom to be patient, the freedom to be kind, the freedom to be wise, the freedom to be courageous. This is freedom for excellence, and it does require training, discipline, and obedience. Wow. That's a, that's a really great way to put it. You know, if you want to free your creativity in a certain aspect or in a certain way, you have to be obedient to the steps to, to learn that craft, to learn that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Right, right. You know, and, and I think it depends on the way people view obedience because I can see people saying, oh, well, being obedient to God or whatever. But it's like, you know, it depends on the way you look at it. You know, like there's positives and negative ways to look at obedience. Um, like if we look at the human ways, of course, we're going to see negatives. But if you look at the obedience to God in a sense of like we're being obedient to this all powerful being that knows better than we do how to organize our lives in a way that will lead to the least amount of suffering in some sense. Right. Um, like the Ten Commandments, you know, that was laid out for us as a guidebook for how to live life and to avoid pain and suffering. And so it's like, yeah, sure, you can ignore that if you want to, but good luck you know, enjoying life, you know, because you're going to have a whole bunch of negative consequences. Even like it's something like as simple as like adultery, right? You're going to have jealousy. You're going to have hurt feelings. Children, if they're involved, they're going to be negatively impacted by it, which leads a whole wave of psychological suffering. I mean, if you look at the psychological literature, divorces and adultery and stuff like that, when it affects children, I mean, it just, it can go down the generations for like years, you know? So yeah, like I think obedience to God when you look at it in that way, it's a very positive thing because you're avoiding pain, you know? And so I love that uh, John chapter 8, here's Jesus saying that if you, if you keep my word, uh, you'll truly be my disciple. You'll know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Uh, for anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave has no permanent place in the household of God. But the son does. And if the son has come to set you free, you are free indeed. So this beautiful passage, again, is speaking about that anyone who commits sin, such as adultery, becomes a slave to sin. And you're constantly living in fear and worry that your, your spouse will find out the secret relationship you have. And you're living, you're two-faced, you're living two lives you're constantly. And your life is getting smaller and smaller and you're, you're finding yourself trapped in a prison. That's slavery. The only way out is to repent. And that's, that's the good news. That's why Jesus came that we may ask and receive mercy. Mercy is, is the power of God, the power of Jesus to separate good from evil, to set captives free. It's, again, the truth that will set us free. Yeah, I like how he, he frames it as, as a slavery because you do. I mean, if you're stuck in sin, you're going to, like you said, it's all just going to collapse around you. And before you know it, you don't have as much control as you thought. How were you going to say, was it? And yeah, and, and, you know, talking about repentance, talking about, you know, cleansing yourself, you know, I think one of the questions that a lot of people, you know, especially the youth ask themselves is, you know, who's keeping tabs of all these, of all my sins, of all my good things, you know, who's keeping tabs, you know, if, the, if I had to, for example, uh, you know, say, you know, is salvation real is, is, you know, or how do I become a saint, you know, in the first place, like, is that even possible? And, 
what, what would you say, what would you say to that father, you know, who's keeping tabs, you know, and can people really become saints or, or is that something that, you know, somebody just made up or. Right, right, right. Absolutely. God wants, God created us to be saints. He definitely created us for eternal joy, eternal peace, eternal love, eternal virtue. To be holy as God is holy, to be perfect as God is perfect. And this definition of perfect is, is to love like God, who loves both uh, the good and the evil alike. We are called to be like the sun that's always shining. Uh, yes, like the saints star, that shine like stars in the midst of darkness. Um, absolutely. And, and nothing is impossible for God. Miracles are miracles. Um, even I'm not impossible for God. And, you know, amazing grace has sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I mean, I was lost, but thanks to Jesus, I'm found. I, mean, I was blind, but I'm starting to see how awesome, how good God is. God has a wonderful, awesome plan for all of us and each of us. He's passionately in love with us. Absolutely, yes, definitely God keeps a tab. As we see that, we'll have to give an account at the end of our life for everything we did. Every word that comes out of our mouth, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, we'll have to give an account. So by my, our, out of our mouth comes blessings and out of our mouth comes curses. And we're going to have to give an account, again, of everything we did in our lives. Um, that's, that's what we're called to. We are called to be the image and likeness of God who's holy, who's righteous, who's pure, who is perfect. And we fall short and we need mercy. We need a savior. Um, and blessed are the poor in spirit. We realize this. They ask and they receive. The greatest question to ask and the greatest response to receive is to ask for a savior and to receive Jesus. In him, with him, and through him, we can become saints. Nothing is impossible for our Lord Jesus. But yes, it does require our yes. Yeah, I like that. I do know that right now we have a couple minutes left still in our meeting, uh, but it will be ending shortly. But I'm not sure if if uh, still you have a like a last last question that you would like to ask before we wrap up the the call. Right. Um. Let me see here. Um. Well, there was one other one, um, and it's a complicated one as well about free will versus determinism. And I think y'all two kind of get an idea of where I'm coming with, with that in terms of uh, God being all powerful, but also like seeing the future, but then we also have free will. I know a lot of kind of like pre like it was a movement. Yeah. For some time that, you know, our life, if it's destined, then do we really have free will? Right. Is that what you mean? That being said, we have seven minutes. So what do y'all got? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, Yes, yes, predestined is in scripture, it's such as Romans chapter 8, that we are predestined. Uh, absolutely, God definitely created us with purpose, with a plan, with a design. Uh, we create cars and buildings with a blueprint, with a, with a plan, with a design. He created us, each of us, with a very unique uh, purpose and plan, which somehow miraculously includes our, our free will includes our even our mistakes and sins god can make everything work for good uh so yes the, the calvinists they're called from the, uh, john calvin uh, came up this idea that some people are predestined to heaven others are predestined to hell and so we have to kind of pretend that we're predestined for heaven and then we'll hopefully get it and then otherwise we'll go to hell and so no it's, it's the, that that predestination i think is a very very faulty definition because, again, we have to honor this, this great mystery, but a very important part of creation called free will. Uh, that is, we are the children of God, and children have free will. So you can imagine parents are forming and passing their children and training their children, and they have some idea in mind of how they want their child to become. They want to become, I want my child to become like me. And so we become the best possible example we can be for our children. So our children are being trained to become excellent. Um, so God definitely predestined us that is he planned us he forms us he prepares us with a plan to become like him his image and likeness and it includes it includes our free will maybe one way to understand this is, is gps <laughs> i don't know if you've used gps but it hears this voice uh coming through you know this phone as you're driving you know it's just turn right turn left has the whole map and then you go the wrong way you know <laughs> instead of turning right you turn left well, what Siri does, or whoever the, the, the voice is, 
then re-alters the route. So, okay, you went the wrong way, but this is how you go back to the right way, and this is how you'll reach your destination. So, again, God definitely has a destination for us, which is called the kingdom of God. It includes our free will. And as long as we desire and, and yes, choose to be obedient, cooperate with this voice that's telling us the way, the truth, the life. I am the good shepherd. Those who listen to my voice will follow me. And I am the way, the truth, the eternal life. And he takes us to our destiny. And when we go the wrong way because of sin, God is merciful. He stretches out his hand and he redirects the route so we'll reach his destiny that he has for us. But again, that includes our free will. We have the power to reject him. And we have the power indeed to go to, to help. Jesus invites us, but he also warns us. But ultimately, he respects our final choice. Yeah, that's a very, I think it's very well so, said. So, yeah, yeah I, I guess, you know, the predestined idea is more in the sense of like predestined to go to heaven. Everyone's predestined to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. um, but I think how some people take it is that, oh, well, like kind of like you, what you were saying, the Cal, uh, Calvinism movement, I guess, that you mentioned. That some people are meant to go to hell and some people are meant to commit, uh, you know, murders and some people are meant to do great things and, you know, love and, and, you know, there's that both sides of the spectrum and some people will go to heaven, some people will go to hell and maybe some in the middle. Right. And, but it, that's not what he's, what he's saying, right. Predestined is more in the idea of everybody has a destination of heaven uh, as human beings, but throughout you know life we have this free will right and so that's how both of them can coexist right, right. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. both are called to 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 live and go to heaven but then we have our free will yeah like the predestination in the bible that's what that means is to heaven and we choose whether we want to move closer or farther away yeah. and for for those who didn't grow up in the church is that do they also have that GPS towards heaven or, or what if they, they never, you know, figure out whose voice that was, you know, maybe they, they, they thought, you know, Oh, um, maybe I'm just hallucinating. Or, you know, what, what is hap What happens to them? Is that a limbo state that they go into? Right. Well, no, in the end, there's only two destinies with him or without him forever. And it does include free will for everyone according to what's been given to us. And those who've been given more, more is expected. Mm. Uh, so actually it's been said by uh, saint, some saints like St. Leonard says, the bottom of hell are Catholics, <laughs> you know, who, who choose not to obey God's commandments. Again, the more that's been given to you, the more, more responsibility you have. So in that sense, Catholic priests are going to be judged much more severely than a lot of people in the world. So that's, that's why we don't judge souls. We don't judge people. We judge actions. We judge thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. Um, but when it comes to those in the world, you know, we're all in a sense in the world. And, and so we do have to be careful with, with um, judgments. And here's, here's the, the wrestling match. It's, it's Romans chapter 9 versus uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that God wills for everyone to be saved. Romans chapter 9, here's Paul saying that God who is the potter, we are the clay, and he has the, the power to make some, uh, some vessels for his glory and other vessels for just ordinary use, and yet some vessels for his wrath. Um, and again, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And this is a great mystery. That, yeah. that somehow, yes, we do have free will. Uh, we will be judged by what's been given to us in our response. Um, and we, we do. We do see that, that there is evil in this world, and some people choose evil. Mm -hmm. A free will that, you know, we are called to, to heaven, but then we also have this free will on earth. There's a time. There's a time for everything under heaven. There's a time to sow and there's a time to reap. There's a time to plant. There's a time to harvest. And there are, are seasons throughout history. And we see these seasons are Satan making seasons where it's a time to harvest. And so one example was World War II. Um, this great mystery. Uh, uh, evil was allowed to rise to at a, at a vast level. The Nazi empire. But it pre 
it produced so many saints. So it's a time of harvesting. Um, it could very well be that we're heading toward another harvest time of great suffering, great persecution, but a time of great Pentecost where sin increases, grace abounds. So God allows things to happen for a greater good. God allowed his son to be crucified for the greater good, the resurrection. So indeed, God allows. Yeah. So God can allow evil to happen. And the greater good is is just a multitude of martyrs and saints and witnesses who who choose the way of heaven and become a witness to everyone around them. Um, That's good news, light for the world. And certainly this world needs good news. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for wrapping up that. Uh, section and we also uh, wanted to learn a little bit about your story and and um, have our, our listeners also hear a little bit about how you became a priest and um, you know the the you know what made you go into the priesthood maybe there's some listeners uh, listening to us today uh, who are thinking about that and so uh, that would be you know great if you could share that with us wonderful I highly recommend it there's any Young men out there that are discerning, it is such an awesome privilege to be a priest. Uh, Certainly a privilege that I'm not worthy of, but Jesus is worthy and amazing grace. He can work through anything. Miracle, he can even work through me. (laughs) I'm from New Jersey, wonderful upbringing. I was raised in a a Presbyterian family, uh, baptized at the age of 10. Um, And when I went to college, uh, eight hours away from New Jersey, way up in Maine, I realized my high school was just a yearbook. My parents was just a phone call. Home was just a vacation. And my childhood was dead. I mean, it was gone. It's just a memory. And, and I couldn't escape reality. Everything's going to die. And if everything dies and ends up in grief, like I am right now in college, what's the use of living? And I knew suicide wasn't the answer. But what is? I need someone who's risen from the dead. Oh, so I had to get rid of my pride. And, and I, it was on my birthday when I turned 19 years old, and I, I radically chose Jesus. I said, here, God, catch. I totally give you my life. And I began a life of prayer seeking to please God, thanking God and repenting for any way I failed. And little by little, I was learning to form my conscience. I devoured scripture. I just loved reading the word of God. And my major was anthropology, so I studied all the religions of the world. And all of it seemed to point back toward the fulfillment, which was the gospel the life of Jesus, Christianity, and I just hungered for more and more. It was in my third year in college when I was down in Ecuador, and and there I was helping a guy push a pickup truck, trying to be that good uh, good Samaritan, and little did I know the guy was stealing the pickup truck. The police came, beat us up, and and I had a wonderful weekend in jail. And it it was in jail that I realized it's not just Jesus in me, it's Jesus in we, we, we need the church. We need the whole body of Christ, which is the church. You know, a thumb can't be a thumb without the hand. And, you know, I can't be a Christian without the, without the other Christians, without the other members of the body of Christ called the church. And I, I love history. You read all of scripture. It tells a wonderful story from Adam to Abraham to David, all the way to the son of David, the Messiah, then the apostles. And then it stops at the end of the first century. Well, then what? Well, as a Presbyterian, I was kind of taught, well, nothing really happens for 1,500 years until Martin Luther comes. I was like, wait a minute, what happened? Oh, it's something called the Catholic Church. Oh, so I learned more and more. I love history and I love the saints. And you'll know the tree by its fruits. So that's how I became a Catholic in my way at the age of 22. It was four years later that I found my way here in San Antonio. I was looking for a religious community um, to live like St. Francis. Just live and a simple fa- life. Father, sorry to interrupt. But what, what made you, you know, become a, a Catholic? Yeah, again, well, there, there were many reasons. And I just gave one about just I love history. And, and the Catholic Church is the fullness. That's what Catholic means. It means universal. 2,000-year history of the Holy Spirit. And, and then the fruit of this history are the lives of the saints. Absolutely beautiful. I need heroes. We all need heroes. And to read the lives of these beautiful men and women to look up to and inspired, challenged me to be holy and beautiful like them. And uh, I, I love, I, 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 need, I need God now. I need him here and now, not just up in heaven and someday I'll see him. I need him here and now. And that's the mystery of the incarnation, the word becoming flesh, which continues through to this day in the Catholic Church called the Holy Eucharist, the sacraments, that God is here in a very powerful way through the sacraments. 
And when I entered the Catholic Church, I sensed his presence. And, and uh, I, I truly, yes, it, it was my whole body and being was saying, I'm truly home. This is my true home. I was just in jail. I'm homeless. I need a spiritual home. Oh, the Catholic Church. That's my true home. What, yeah, what reinforced it, confirmed it was called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For the first time, I, I was reading Acts of the Apostles, which really is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I want what they had. You know, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as I began to pray, I was just overwhelmed with God's love. And my whole body was shaking, filled with God's love. And that's when I began to make the first steps of entering uh, the Catholic Church. So, yeah, entering the Catholic Church, where do I belong in this big, huge, <laughs> universal church? And so I was looking for a religious community. So I looked in the Jesuits. I looked in the missionary servants of the Most Holy Trinity. I was in East L.A. East LA. I was down in Mexico. I was over in Alabama. I was looking for my place in the Catholic Church. And it was there in Alabama. I got the invitation. Well, come to San Antonio. There's a new religious community. Brothers of the Beloved Disciple uh, right here from the foot of the cross. There lie like, um, you know, John the Beloved. We take Mary, our mother, and, and Jesus handed over the spirit. So the brothers of the Beloved Disciple are Mary and charismatic community. Uh, I was happy just being a religious brother. But as I learned more about the Catholic Church, it became more and more obvious there's need for priests. And I do love worship. I love the Mass. And I, boy, I do love, perhaps you can tell, I love to preach. I love the Word of God. Maybe God is calling me to be a priest. And obviously, the more I, I studied in preparation for priesthood, the more it was being confirmed again and again. These interior signs, exterior signs, God was calling me to be a priest. So it was in 2004, at the age of 34, I, I was ordained a a Catholic priest. I've been a priest now for 17 years and loving it. I can I highly recommend it. It's it's just a wonderful privilege to to follow Jesus in such a privileged way. All of us have a special calling. So keep listening. God has a unique plan for you. Um, know how special you are. Know how much we need you. Uh, you're unique and one of a kind. Uh, and you're full of purpose. And God has a wonderful plan for you. Um, that He can you can be that wonderful revelation of His love. Thank you, Father. Yeah, I think that that's, I don't know about you still, but I think that's a great way to finish off uh, the, the testimony is just, you know, I think what moves people and especially coming from a priest. I think it was really interesting, actually, and a lot of good points. There's just one other thing I want to touch on because I didn't know that you majored in or, or studied uh, anthropology. And so I guess my final question then in that case would be, um, how would you respond to people who say, well, how, how, how how do you know to believe in the Christian God when there's like 12 other, or there's 11 other world religions, right? Um, well, I, I looked at it myself. And I was like, I think two of those religions are atheistic anyway. So God doesn't have anyone to compete with, but yeah. How would you respond to that? You, since you studied it. And yes, I did. And the best, best, my best understanding is God is father. God is son. God is Holy spirit. And God is one. And so we, we do have the, the religions that emphasize the, the, the transcendent God who is in heaven, uh, uh, Muslims, certainly Jews, uh, um, Jehovah Witnesses, um, Arianists focus on that, that God is transcendent, God is above. Um, and so we, we, us Christians, believe God is Father who art in heaven. And then, then God is, is one of us. God, God is human. So, yeah, the humanists, the, 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 the secularists, the agnostics, the atheists who says, yeah, well, we're God, you know, we're, we're the crown of creation you know, and, and we can make our own, our own decisions. We don't need anyone to tell us what to do. Okay. So, okay. And as much as God became human, okay, God, the son, Jesus. And then, well, God is spirit. God is everywhere. And we can see him in the cosmos and the universe. And he's moving in so many different ways. Well, there you go. That's Hinduism. And in a sense, um, a lot of the Native American religion or the Native religions, indigenous religions, that God is spirit. God is everywhere. Okay, God, the Holy Spirit. So there are, there are signs, uh, elements, um, rays of truth and grace that can be found in all religions. They're, all those religions have a fulfillment, and they find their fulfillment in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who revealed himself uh, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Awesome. I like it. Well, thank you very much, Father Will. Uh, again, we thank you for your time. You know, it's very valuable um, and you have a lot of, on your plate, but we also pray for you and, and uh, we you. wish you the best um, and we will continue to stay in touch. And thank you everyone who uh, got to listen to this show today. 
uh, we appreciate uh, you taking your time to also listen to us. And uh, we hope that you were blessed by this episode and uh, gain a lot of wisdom and knowledge uh, from uh, Father Will and, and, and um, a Catholic priest. And until next time, if, if you do happen to have any questions, please leave a comment down below. Uh, we'll make sure to, to get back with you with some, with some answers. And um, uh, we will see you soon. Thank you very much, Father Will, again. And uh, until the next time. <laughs>